we done as a design project is make sure that the car had the signature cab Ford body. With the three and a half litres and the V6 configuration and the supercharger, when you start an acceleration from very low RPM, as low as 1500 RPM, the car just pulls and pulls and pulls and gets stronger and stronger as the revs increase. And this is what a real you know, sports car feels like. So when you turn the car, the car stays really flat to the road. It gives you a sensation that the CFG is very low. It makes the car very enjoyable to drive, very responsive, intuitive to drive. The V6 is fantastic. Supercharged, so you have a huge amount of torque and power connected to a precision manual shift mechanism. The Amira has four drive modes. Tour is to give maximum stability control to allow a little bit of what we call body slip and increase the throttle response. Race, we changed the HMI in front of you drastically to give you the performance rev counter. We allow the car to have more slip in the stability, but we never degrade the ABS, so you'll always stop as fast in every mode as you would in any. In the last mode, fully off, we actually keep the ABS, but we turn all the ESC systems off completely. It's 100% controlled by the driver. From concept, the interior in the Amira is just as important as the exterior. Making it really modern in feel, having touch screens, the position of the gear shift. It had to be next to the steering wheel, you never have to look down. Small movement, precise movement. Aero and thermal capacity is hugely important to Lotus. Brakes can run up to 500 degrees C, so you need that to keep them under control you know, no matter how hard you're driving. A Lotus will always have downfall, so it's actually being sucked to the road. The whole package is tuned to give you maximum reward and confidence. This is such a great circuit. I mean, most road cars on tracks just don't work, but this does. Standing at over 12,000 square meters, it's the size of one and a half football pitches. Some 4,800 Amiras will be produced here every year on a single shift pattern. And it's remarkable to think that this incredibly high-tech facility is a world away from the Lotus factories of old. What's most striking is there are no production lines in the floor. Instead, individual chassis are maneuvered around the site on these automated guided vehicles. Come on then. The AGVs, as they're known, move cars on set routes around the factory. The route is easily programmed, future-proofing for any new production requirements. Each of the AGVs has a height adjustment system, so operators can get the car to a comfortable working height. The all-new paint shop is also state-of-the-art and will improve the quality and throughput of vehicles at the site. It features lots of impressive sounding technologies, such as a combined primer and a clear coat line. Its dry filtration uses 60% less energy than a wet system. While the electrostatic primer, essentially a process of creating an electrostatic charge in the paint and on the part, reduces paint usage by 30 to 40%. And every car that comes off the production line gets tested here on the refurbished 2.2 mile track. Go on! That's how you use a track. You've seen him on the track. He's driven the car, now let's meet him in person. Ladies and gentlemen, Jensen Button.
Jensen, welcome. So, how is it to drive the Amira? Well, first of all, it's fantastic to be here. A real privilege, a pleasure to see so many uh, smiling faces. And uh, what better way to, to launch uh, an iconic car in true British weather? Uh, now we have sun. Now I've come out on stage, which I'm very happy about. But um, I, I was uh, very lucky to take this uh, beauty, that beauty out on uh, track earlier. Um, and it was really enjoyable. Uh, you know, you expect to have the mechanical grip, as you heard in the uh, three-minute video. Um, you expect to have that mechanical grip from a Lotus, but um, to have the aero uh, and, you know, everything on this car has a purpose. You know, all these lines, intakes, uh, the curvatures, they have a purpose, and that's what I love most about it. Uh, and then you step inside, uh, and as I said, plush. That's the word of the day. Um, it's, it's such a nice place to be. It's comfortable. You have the infotainment system which is easy to work so you can get back to uh, hammering through the gears and uh, they've moved the gear stick in this car quite high uh, and uh, it feels really racy so uh, from the steering wheel to the gear stick it's it's such a short movement which is great uh, it feels much more racy and uh, I obviously like that well, I think you've sold it to us, to be honest. Um, you've loved Lotus cars since you were young. In fact, since you were too young to actually drive one. Uh, well, no, I was, I was legally allowed to drive one, but I was, I was 17. Uh, I, I actually started off in something that was not a, a Lotus and very far from a Lotus when I was 17. Uh, but I drove past the uh, Bristol dealership, uh, the Bristol showroom, and there was a Lotus Elise out on the grass. So I went in and I said, uh, can I drive that? And they said, no. One, one word, that's all that they gave me, no. I was like, well, can I sit in it? They said, okay, you can sit in it. So I sat in the car, um, and I remember it just being very sparse, first of all. You basically had a seat, three pedals, a steering wheel, and a gear stick. Um, but I just loved that feeling of a Lotus when you got in it, you felt part of it. And uh, that was what I loved the most. Um, obviously, the interior of these is very different. It's moved on a long way, but um, I had the bug then, uh, and I got to drive in my friend's Esprit, uh, which was uh, very exciting, uh, very powerful. Um, and, uh, and also in 2000, I got to come here while I was working with another manufacturer doing laps around here, um, passenger rides. And at the end of the day, I said, can I drive the Lotus 340R? And I said, yeah, of course you can. And jumped in it, and it was worlds beyond what I was driving around here. So yes, very passionate about Lotus, and uh, great to be part of the team. And having the chance to drive these uh, really means a lot. And you're bringing back a classic Lotus, aren't you? Yes, um, bringing back the Type 62, where they, they built two for racing. Uh, and uh, Radford, um, with my mates at Radford, we're bringing back, uh, it doesn't sound very professional, does it, with my mates at Radford, but they are my mates. Um, we're bringing back uh, the Type 62 2, um, which I'm really, really looking forward to. It's something very exciting uh, for the future. And uh, we're very lucky that we've been able to work with Lotus on the platform uh, and uh, with the engineers and, and the development of it. So exciting for the future, but right now, we're here for these guys, and I must say, in this colour, stunning, isn't it? It is absolutely what amazing. Would, what would you choose? I, I I'm can't not decide. It, well, I no, I'm going to buy one. I think I'd probably go for the blue. Yeah. yeah. And are you going to live up to your end of the bargain with Matt from earlier? Well, if I get on the top of the list, yes. I mean, yes. I can't say no to it. It's stunning, and I, the problem is for me is colour. Um, I like this. I personally would really go for the yellow. Mm -hmm. The yellow with that fleck in it, you know, I think it would show off the, the curves a little bit. But um, no, it's, uh, it's a spectacular car and I can't believe we're calling it a junior supercar. Um, because it would take on so many powerhouses out on track. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm super excited and everyone that's worked on this car should be very, very proud. The ambition for the design team from the outset was to create a car that had the visual drama of a supercar, but package it up in a vehicle that is affordable, that is compact, that is of high quality, and most importantly, everyday usable. When we say supercar, there are really three elements. First of all, there's the obvious reference to the Avaya hypercar that we launched two years ago. That was always intended to be a statement of a new design language, so why wouldn't we use this on this new car, our first volume-produced sports car? 
Secondly, combining beautiful soft sculpture with technical details, the balance between form and function. And then finally is the proportion. It's getting the car to look low, hunkered down, something that invites you to drive it. At the front of the car, we've got this very sharp attacking nose section that looks like it's gonna cleave through the air. And that's really important. We want the car to express speed even when it's standing still. Also on the front are the very distinctive headlights, which give the car a unique signature when it's looming up behind you at night. You'll notice that the lines flow very beautifully in three course of view from the bonnet into the side sculpture. And the way we play with light and shadow on there helps us describe a car that is very athletic, a car that looks planted to the road, a car that's gonna be exciting to drive. Aerodynamics is that tangible, direct link. It is, if you like, the, the science behind the beauty of the car. Every feature on the car, every shape on the car's bodywork, it has a part to play in terms of the way the airflow flows around it, the way it guides the airflow into certain positions to do certain jobs. The splitter, that captures the air at the front. It stagnates the air on top of the splitter to generate downforce to counteract some of that upper body lift which is generated by the car. You've got the air blades in the corner intakes, those characteristic boomerang or nostril vents in the bonnet. They physically suck the airflow out of the cooling system by creating vortices, which low pressure core drags the air out to help the efficiency of the cooling system and direct the airflow down and around the sides of the car. Those vents down the C-pillar of the car, again, they're positioned precisely to be aligned with the two counter-rotating vortices that roll over the back of the car with low pressure cores to suck out the hot air from the engine bay. Everybody knows that the car has got to be beautiful, but it's also got to work. And it's getting that harmony and balance between what it looks like and how it performs that is key. When we get to the rear of the car, there are some beautiful details. This is our last combustion engine car and we really want to separate that. So when you look at the exhaust pipes inside there, there's some beautiful perforations. The C-shaped section, rear lights, very distinctive. The car looks incredibly broad and muscular. Rear view of the car is something very powerful, something very distinctive. The interior should help you connect with the vehicle totally. Behind the seats, you can put a couple of cabin bags if you're going on a trip. We've got storage in the doors. We've got twin storage in the center console above and below the main line. We also have an armrest with storage in there. And then we have the classic glove box as well. So it really is something that you can use every day, somewhere to put your phone, somewhere to put your sunglasses, etc. As you'll see, we've got twin TFT screens in there, 12.3 and 10.25, but you also have some hard keys on the steering wheel, but also some hard keys for things like heating and volume control. All the major surfaces are either trimmed in leather or in textile or in Alcantara. Many of the touch points are also made out of honest materials as we refer to it, metal, etc. This is an interior that feels extremely sporty, is intuitive to use. So if you wanna drive the car with passion, it doesn't ask anything of you. And equally, if you just wanna use it on a normal trip as well, it's a comfortable environment to be in. We all work together with the one objective of producing the ultimate sports car. All of the features that we have on the Amira are not only wonderfully, beautifully looking features, but they're there for a very specific reason. It's form following function. That's what a Lotus is. It's all about a collection of things as a, as a designer. And I think it's the combination of these dramatic exterior looks with a very sporty, but very luxurious and usable interior as well. That just means it's a car that you can use for any occasion on the road or on the track. It's the culmination of 
decades worth of experience to produce what is, I believe, one of the best sports cars in the world. Lotus and Mira, and what a way to make an entrance. What do you think? Yeah, everybody's too busy with their phones getting all the shots. Now look, as the sun sets here in Hethel, a new dawn is born for a Mira. This is the last internal combustion engine car the Lotus will ever produce, and it is utterly gorgeous. Just look at it. Absolutely. So to give us the full tour of the car and to see it close up, Let's hear from Lotus's design director, Russell Carr. The ambition for the design team from the outset was to create a car that had the visual drama of a supercar, but package it up in a vehicle that is affordable, is compact, is of high quality, and most importantly, everyday usable. When we say supercar, there are really three elements. First of all, there's the obvious reference to the Avaya hypercar that we launched two years ago. That was always intended to be a statement of a new design language. So why wouldn't we use this on this new car, our first volume produced sports car? Secondly, combining beautiful soft sculpture with technical details, the balance between form and function. And then finally is the proportion. It's getting the car to look low, hunkered down, something that invites you to drive it. At the front of the car, we've got this very sharp attacking nose section that looks like it's going to cleave through the air, and that's really important. We want the car to express speed even when it's standing still. Also on the front are the very distinctive headlights, which give the car a unique signature when it's looming up behind you at night. You'll notice that the lines flow very beautifully in three quarters of you from the bonnet into the side sculpture. And the way we play with light and shadow on there helps us describe a car that is very athletic, a car that looks planted to the road, a car that's going to be exciting to drive. Aerodynamics is that tangible, direct link. It is, if you like, the, the science behind the beauty of the car. Every feature on the car, every shape on the car's bodywork, it has a part to play in terms of the way the airflow flows around it, the way it guides the airflow into certain positions to do certain jobs. The splitter, that captures the air at the front. It stagnates the air on top of the splitter to generate downforce to counteract some of that upper body lift which is generated by the car. You've got the air blades in the corner intakes, those characteristic boomerang or nostril vents in the bonnet. They physically suck the airflow out of the cooling system by creating vortices, which low pressure core drags the air out to help the efficiency of the cooling system and direct the airflow down and around the sides of the car. Those vents down the C pillar of the car, again, they're positioned precisely to be aligned with the two counter rotating vortices that roll over the back of the car with low pressure cores to suck out the hot air from the engine bay. Everybody knows that the car has got to be beautiful, but it's also got to work. 
and it's getting that harmony and balance between what it looks like and how it performs that is key. When we get to the rear of the car, there are some beautiful details. This is our last combustion engine car and we really want to separate that. So when you look at the exhaust pipes inside there, there's some beautiful perforations. The C-shaped section, rear lights, very distinctive. The car looks incredibly broad and muscular. Rear view of the car is something very powerful, something very distinctive. The interior should help you connect with the vehicle totally. Behind the seats, you can put a couple of cabin bags if you're going on a trip. We've got storage in the doors. We've got twin storage in the center console above and below the main line. We also have an armrest with storage in there. And then we have the classic glove box as well. So it really is something that you can use every day, somewhere to put your phone, somewhere to put your sunglasses, etc. As you'll see, we've got twin TFT screens in there, 12.3 and 10.25, but you also have some hard keys on the steering wheel, but also some hard keys for things like heating and volume control. All the major surfaces are either trimmed in leather or in textile or in Alcantara. Many of the touch points are also made out of honest materials as we refer to it, metal, etc. This is an interior that feels extremely sporty, is intuitive to you. So if you want to drive the car with passion, it doesn't ask anything of you. And equally, if you just want to use it on a normal trip as well, it's a comfortable environment to be in. We all work together with the one objective of producing the ultimate sports car. All of the features that we have on the Amira are not only wonderfully, beautifully looking features, but they're there for a very specific reason. It's form following function. That's what a Lotus is. It's all about a collection of things as a, as a designer. And I think it's the combination of these dramatic exterior looks with a very sporty, but very luxurious and usable interior as well. That just means it's a car that you can use for any occasion on the road or on the track. It's the culmination of decades worth of experience to produce what is, I believe, one of the best sports cars in the world. The Amira. Russell, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for talking through some, some of those incredible design elements of the Amira. So now so it's out of the box. Are you excited for people to see it? I'm tremendously excited. You know, we've been locked away in the studio for the last two and a half years, slaving over this car, obsessing about the, the details, eat sleeping, eat, sleeping and drinking this car. But what it's all about is now sharing with all the fans, the owners, the media, and our family as well. All those people who are wondering why we were spending so many hours at work and giving. Well, now they can see, and it was worth it. So the Amaya was a statement of intent, and you can see that in the Amira. So what else are you working on? Well, we've got a whole range of cars to work on at the moment, but uh, the nature of our business is that it's completely about confidentiality. We make the military seem sort of quite open. <laughs> so I can't share any details about those cars at the moment. Fantastic, well I might just pop by and see what's going on. Matt, now it's out of the box, can you stand the excitement? <laughs> Helen, I'm really excited and so pleased to bring the car to the world on behalf of all of the staff. I mean, hundreds of people have worked on this car. And I think it's quite fitting, the sun shining on Lotus. <laughs> Russell, Matt, thank you so much.